Feast TV is brought to you with support from Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, LaCole Culinaire, The Raphael Hotel, and New Season Spa and Salon. In this episode, we're exploring all things aquatic. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. we are focused on all things aquatic and I don't want to say seafood because the fish that we are going to be focused on are all produced right here in this region and we're going to be exploring everything from caviar to tilapia. I'm sitting here with Nate Hereford who is the executive chef at Niche Restaurant in Clayton, Missouri and what you're doing here is incredibly unique not just for our region, but in the country, and you only are cooking with ingredients that are from within a 200 mile radius of the restaurant. Exactly, so a lot of our focus, like as you said, is cooking uh, super regional uh, Missouri cuisine. It kind of gives you a nice definition of where we come from, and also supports our local agriculture um, systems that come up. Specifically as it relates to fish, seafood, things like that, what are some of the ways that you're sourcing those ingredients? Um, you know, it's been a variety of different ways. Uh, we've gotten in touch with some uh, great fisheries, uh, places like Troutdale Farms down in uh, Troutdale, Missouri. And then uh, we also use Show Me Caviar as well, coming out of Morrison and Gascony County. Um, and I mean, sometimes, you know, we just catch carp. You know, it just kind of depends on where we're at. We'll take parts of uh, the trout from Troutdale and we'll turn it into fish sauce. Or we'll make a soy sauce out of it. And then we'll make, you know, maybe a smoked trout broth. And we just kind of try to look at food differently. So, caviar. No one would think that such high quality caviar in particular would come from the waters here in Missouri, but they, they really, it really does. You know, when I first came here, I was kind of blown away by the quality of the local caviar and it's local caviar. So caviar always works well with something. So we're doing um, a caviar taco, kind of cool, something unique that you don't really hear of every day, caviars and tacos. It's kind of like but, a play um, on the fish taco. Yeah, exactly, you know, but it kind of demonstrates what we're doing here at the restaurant, like super local ingredients. Uh, we're taking wheat berries, we're making our own masa out of the wheat, and then uh, we have the, the caviar, uh, it's kind of the star of the show. We also have some pork chicharrones and a little bit of hot sauce, because it's a taco after all. I can't wait, let's get in the kitchen and see how that comes together. So here we are, we're gonna make uh, masa tacos uh, with caviar. So basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna cook the masa, uh, tortillas. Um, and the surprising thing is, is the aroma is very similar to corn from the uh, nixtamalization process. However, the uh, wheat kind of gives it a, a darker, more robust flavor. And I like to kind of think of it as a little more Missouri. We fermented some uh, habanero peppers coming to us from Burger Bluff Farms. We also have a little bit of yogurt. And then we have uh, some other things, some nasturtium we got from our friends at Ozark Mushrooms. And then some anise hyssop that we grew ourselves. And then we have the pork chicharrones, and these are coming to us from Newman Farms, and the paddlefish caviar. So we're just start with a little bit of yogurt in the bottom, a little bit of creaminess, a little bit of pork skins, and then just a little bit of the hot sauce. It's kind of funky, adds a really nice note. So the caviar, we kind of like to go big because, once again, it's caviar, it's an awesome product. And then we have uh, the hyssop. Hyssop's gonna give kind of a nice, uh, a nice note. I like to kind of think of it almost as like, uh, root beer kind of flavor, and then um, some of the shredded nasturtium leaf, and then some nice uh, flowers. And then we'd have our caviar tacos. So to see where this gorgeous caviar comes from, we are heading down to Southern Missouri. Come on. We got up at the crack of dawn to come out here to the Osage Cat Fisheries in Osage Beach, Missouri. And I'm here with Steve Cars. Now, morning. good morning. <laughs> this company was founded back in the 50s by your dad. Correct. Dad came to the lake and started out with three ponds and a little bait business. And uh, that many years later, we ship our fish all over the world. And that's what's really amazing is that you're not just, you know, 
shipping to Missouri, I mean, you really are an international sure. company. Yeah. When they get the fish, what do they do? Do they stock ponds? Like Most of the, yeah, the fish that we, we sell them are what we consider seed stock. So they're either trying to beef up their bloodline with a new bloodline or introduce a new species into the country. So how many ponds are there behind this building? There's probably only about 10, 10 units on this farm, uh, which we turned into a golf course here at Lake of the Ozarks. Our other two big production facilities cons consist of about, uh, about 200 acres of water or impoundments That's that amazing. we grow the fish in. So let's talk about the caviar. Caviar is produced by Osage Cat Fisheries, and it is it mainly paddlefish caviar? It's all paddlefish caviar, yeah. This is a, a fish that my dad wanted to work with back in the oh, middle 70s, and um, before the fish was listed on a protected species by the Fish and Wildlife. Dad kind of saw what was happening in the Russian uh, production of the beluga caviar, and if that population was declining, paddlefish to produce a good black row. So it's we start delicious. Yeah, I mean, you. it's really, it if you have never had Missouri caviar, you have to have it. What is it about these particular breeds of fish that make such a wonderful caviar? Uh, it's probably the uh, richness of the eggs. The eggs that the sturgeon and paddlefish produce is a very rich, very rich egg. A lot of other fish, uh, trout, salmon caviar, things like that, it's a, it's a clear, clear egg. Uh, this is a very fatty, fatty egg, and that's what makes it makes it so good. Oh, it's buttery and yeah. delicious. Yeah. I love it. The paddlefish themselves, describe the fish for me because they're very unusual looking. It's a fish with a long spoon. They, they have another name for it, it's a spoonbill. They're, they've done research with these fish. The spoon is actually uh, has electrical pulse, pulses through it. Oh, wow. And it can help the fish navigate and also find its food source, which is in the water column. They're a filter feeder. They have gill rakes, like some whales. And uh, so when they swim through the water, they're feeding all the time. That's amazing. Yeah, that's how they can grow so fast. Wow, yeah. and they grow to what size? Uh, some females that we just harvested probably no more than three weeks ago, uh, they were from a 2002 year class and a couple of females were over 120 pounds of feed. You did mention that they're protected. So yeah. how do you sustainably raise and harvest these fish? Uh, every spring, uh, since we do have uh, what they call a CITES permit, which is issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, that allows us to export our products. Um, and we're the only farm in the U.S. that has that. Since we were producing the fish before they were listed, so when the fish ovulate, then we start stripping the eggs, uh, fertilize the eggs, and then we put them in what we call McDonald's jars. Uh, which simulates how the eggs would tumble in the river uh, if they spawn naturally. So you're breeding the paddlefish right here? Right here, yeah, right here in this facility. Uh, we keep them in here for a set number of days, then they're released into the nursery units, and then we, we grow them up to the size we need to introduce into our ranching program for caviar. And so once you harvest the eggs, I mean, all of they are really, they're just cured. It's just salt cure, isn't it? Correct. Most sim it's the simplest procedure but you can screw up a lot of good eggs real fast if you don't have somebody that knows what they're doing. So where does your amazing caviar go? Uh, the vast majority of it goes to uh, Asia right now. So other than that, with because you are called a cat fishery, so do you also sell catfish? We sell a lot of catfish. Um, in fact, today we're harvesting a lot of catfish for the Missouri Department of Conservation to go to the Bush Wildlife Area in St. Louis for uh, angling programs for kids and adults. And um, we raise 32 different species. 32? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, we raise everything from the paddlefish is kind of our Cadillac. Then we raise gar species, long nose gar, short nose gar, alligator gar, uh, blue catfish, channel catfish, bluegill. I mean, the list goes on and on. So like we have an, a big, big aquarium that we're doing out west. And these are all adult fish coming from our brood stock. Uh, very high-end fish that will be trucked out to this new aquarium in, in, uh, out west and, and they'll be on display. I mean, who knew? Well, it's, it's kind of a niche market, but if these companies can get all the fish they want for native Missouri, Mississippi Valley displays from us in one spot. So. I like the fact that it's a small family company and we deal with Fortune 500 companies all across the world. That was an amazing look at how caviar 
can be made locally, but there are more fish that are produced in a regional basis and you're utilizing trout from Troutdale Farm. Yep, yep. so what we do is we uh, use uh, utilize in a couple different facets on our menu, um, all the way from the actual fillets to a uh, Roman style condiment called garum. Um, it's basically like a fish sauce. All right, let's head down to Troutdale and see what the farm looks like. It is a gorgeous spring day and we are at Troutdale Farm, which is a purveyor of some of the most amazing trout and I cannot wait to get the tour from Dennis. Well, one of the best ways to tour a trout farm is start at the source of the water. So does the spring have a name? Yes, it has multiple names. It's called the Collins Spring. Another name is the Big Spring at Gravois Mills. We just call it Troutdale. <laughs> Gorgeous. A big portion of the water comes up out of that triangle. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, you can see it kind of bubbling up. Yes. The water temperature is 56 degrees, plus or minus about a half a degree year round. And so trout need cold water. Right. They need very fresh water. And they need clean water and a very high oxygen content relative for uh, fish. And so any opportunity that we can get water to splash around, make a waterfall, we try to do that because that oxygenates the water. So how many trout are in these ponds right now? We're probably in excess of 100,000 fish. Seriously? Yes. Oh, wow. Can we go take a look at them? Oh, absolutely. So how do you harvest them? Do you just take a net and grab them? Now what we do is we call it corralling the fish. We use these uh, dividing gates and push the fish up so that they're they're somewhat crowded. Mm -hmm. and then we have sorting boxes and it has a ruler in there and we actually measure each fish individually. If wow. it's too small they go over on that side. If they're the right size then they're collected and well, I'll show you how we catch fish. I would love to see it. <laughs> okay so you just dunk down. This is harder than it looks because they don't really want to be caught do they? No. Oh, oh you caught some. He's beautiful. That is a beautiful fish. So um, how old are they when they're harvested? At least 14 months. Probably most of them are closer to a year and a half. Some of the ones that are easy to see are called golden rainbow trout. Mm -hmm. And it's a color variation of the rainbow trout. And they are bright yellow. Yes, and they reproduce true to color. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so now I'm standing here with Merritt and this is where all of the trout, once they're harvested, are processed. It's a light, bright, really beautiful room and it's a little bit cool in here and contrary to what people might think, there is absolutely no kind of a fishy smell. It's a very kind of a fresh aroma, almost like kind of being outside next to the, the spring itself. Mm -hmm. So the fish are weighed outside. Yes, the fish are weighed outside. That's an approximate weight so that we know what we're harvesting. Um, we count the fish. We know how many we bring in, approximately 100 at a time. Wow. Um, and it takes us uh, just over an hour. This is a special cut fish. We have the head, the tail, and most of the fins, and it has been pin boned. This goes to a customer who wanted this particular fish to look like this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're sending these to some of the best restaurants in Missouri. Well, we, we like to think so. We have to give all the kudos to the chefs because they, they have the job of creating something unique. 
So what is your favorite part? I've always enjoyed the filleting. I'm a hands-on person. I've trained everybody who has been filleted and they've always turned out to be better than I am, which <laughs> just absolutely drives me nuts. <laughs> We're not fast. You know, we don't grow fish quick. You know, we don't push the system a lot, mm -hmm. and so it, it takes us a while, and there are lots of issues to be dealt with in terms of Mother Nature, and we just take those one day at a time. You know, oh, and it works. And deal with whatever comes. Yeah. I mean, the, the resulting product is amazing. As much as I don't want to leave gorgeous Troutdale Farm, it is time to hit the road. We are heading to Kansas City, and we're going to go to the basement of Anton's where they are raising tilapia. I'm heading down into the basement here at Anton's in Kansas City to check out their aquaponics system where they sustainably raise tilapia that's then served here at the restaurant. Come on with me. I love how bright and cheerful it is down here. Like you go into a basement, you think basement, and it's got to be this kind of dark place. Sure, but sure. It's really cool. When we produce herbs out of here, their flavor is as big and bold as it came off of a farm. It's incredible. Um, and I believe it's because of the nutrients that it's getting coming directly from the fish. And so the aquaponics system is kind of the, the centerpiece yes. of the basement. Yes. And how did you build it? Why did you build it? You know, my, my last restaurant that I had was cheesesteaks and pizza, um, which I know wasn't the healthiest thing in the world, but now that I'm a dad, I, I think a lot more about it. And my family, uh, grown up, we had a garden. We had game to eat, uh, you know, local products to eat, and um, our gene pool is, is pretty healthy. There's a lot of things today that I see out there, you know, one in 87 in autism rates. I believe that it has to do with the food that we're eating, and I'm concerned about it. I don't know for sure. I'm not a doctor. I, I don't even have a college degree, but I always tell people it's like heaven. I don't want to find out later when I was misbehaving that there, <laughs> that there is. So it's the same with food for me. Uh, you know, a lot of guys come in and I've consulted with them. They want to open up tilapia farms in greenhouses. The downside to it is you got to figure out how to heat the water because tilapia died about 50 degrees. Okay. Um, they do well at 80. So you're spending uh, three so, quarters of the year in Missouri heating water. Room temperature here yeah. in this kind of a closed environment, it's kind of perfect for it. It does well. Plus, uh, I do have a heating system under my tanks. Um, when we remodeled the building, we put radiant floor tubing in the building and that water is heated by my refrigeration compressors to a temperature between 90 and 95 degrees all year long. So how many fish do you have? Uh, we, we normally hold about 400, between four and 400. 500, yes, yeah. Uh, in a commercial tilapia operation, they'll farm as many as three fish per gallon of water. I hold about 1,000 gallons here, and we have about 800 in the tanks, and we hold about one fish per gallon and a half. We don't believe in overloading. We don't use a uh, copper nitrates or anything for fecal problems. You know, we just want to filter naturally. Can we go in there and take a look? Because sure. I am so curious now. These are duckweed pellets. It's one of their favorite munchies. And what we do is we bring a lot of smaller ones over and put them in this tank, and then as they grow, there's uh, other ones that'll get bigger faster, and then we move them, and we'll put them in here as individuals, and they'll get bigger even faster. Oh, I can see them. Yeah, and then they end up over on this side, and this is where we'll get them harvested from, so. There's like maybe an hour or two between harvest and hitting the yeah, kitchen. Yes. And is the flavor of the just hot tilapia far superior to Fantastic. anything? I would assume so. Yeah, yeah, we can't produce enough for this restaurant already out of these size tanks. Wow. That's why my, my next thing is to get another area to raise some in. There are so many issues regarding sustainability and seafood. 
And so to be able to create a system where we're raising our own seafood here in the Midwest, not only do you, you know, lower the amount of carbon emissions and all of the energy that you're using to get things from all the different spots, then you're lessening the pressure on our oceans on because oceans. we can just produce it and consume it here. Right, right. Well, I think we should get in the kitchen and try those fish tacos. It's so fun to see how these tacos really came to be. I can't believe that the tilapia came from the basement. And what's interesting is that the way that you produce this is very emblematic of your entire philosophy of how you're sourcing all of the different ingredients yes. for the restaurant. So yeah, yeah, we try very hard to to make sure that we're using everything in the in the building. Well, my hope is that more people start to approach food in the way that you do because it's sustainable and it also is delicious. I mean, this could not be more fresh. I'm ready to dig in. So goodbye from Kansas City. Now I'm gonna head into the kitchen and make my own version of fish tacos. Thanks, Anton. Sante. It's been great. Cheers. incredible when you look at how much fish production there is in the Midwest. We always think of, you know, fish is coming in from the coasts and there's a lot happening here. So I really enjoyed being able to show you that, including that amazing basement at Anton's in Kansas City. And our trip there inspired me to make my own fish tacos, which I'm going to show you how to make a fried tilapia fish taco with quick pickled red onions and a creamy sriracha sauce. It's gonna be very, very delicious. And I'm gonna pair that with a vignole from Les Bourgeois, which is right in the middle of Missouri. Vignole is a very, versatile grape. It can be vinified in a number of different styles and this particular wine has a slight, slight sweetness to it, um, but it also has a nice acidic backbone, which is going to help stand up against that fried fish. So it's gonna be really tasty. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is quick pickle my red onions. And what I'm gonna do is very thinly slice this into rings and just put it in my bowl. Now on the stove, I have already heating a quarter cup of water. I'm gonna add in three quarters of a cup of cider vinegar. You have to have that acid. It is key to any pickling recipe. We're gonna add just a half of a teaspoon of salt and an equal amount of sugar. I'm gonna bring that to a boil and all I'm gonna do is pour it on top of my onions and then just let it sit. You want to let it sit for about an hour at least so that it fully pickles those onions or whatever else it is that you're treating this way. And so I'm going to push this off to the side and I'm going to go ahead and make the batter for my fish. In just a regular bowl, I'm going to add one cup of all-purpose flour, a teaspoon of baking powder. I'm going to put in a good dose of paprika for color as well as for flavor. The fish is very mild, so you don't want to put in too much. You want to make sure you don't overpower the flavor of the fish. And then just about a teaspoon or so of salt. I'm going to mix all of this, and then I'm just going to add water until it's about the texture of pancake batter. My oil over here is already heating. I'm using safflower oil because it has a very high smoke point. It's perfect for frying. You could also use peanut oil. That would work really well. What you want is something that is flavor neutral and has that high smoke point. Okay, you can see here, we have a nice, slightly loose texture because I don't want the batter to be thick. You don't want it to have this hard crust on the fish. You want something that's gonna be light and delicate and enhance that texture of the fish. So I'm gonna put this aside real quick. I'm gonna go ahead and cut my tilapia. And because these are tacos, I do want 
my fish to be in strips. It's one of the great things about tilapia is that it's very flaky, almost like a catfish or even a trout, like we saw at Troutdale. But it also has a great firmness to it, so you can do things that are a little bit less delicate, like frying it. So when you're frying, you want to make sure that your oil is at the right temperature before you add all of your gorgeous, gorgeous fish. This is looking terrific. And here's our mound of golden brown fried tilapia. So now I'm going to make the rest of all the goodies that we're going to be piling on top of our tacos. First thing, super easy. We're just going to shred some cabbage. Of course, can't have real tacos without limes. So what I'm making right now is that wonderful creamy sauce that you have on top of traditional fried fish tacos. And it's really simple to make. It is just mayo and either sriracha or hot sauce or something like that, salt and pepper. And so this is gonna play beautifully off of the fried, crunchy, hot fish these raw elements, and then of course, our pickled red onions, which have that kind of like sweet tart quality. So I'm just gonna go ahead and build myself a taco. A little bit of cabbage, yum. Putting on my cilantro. Now I'm gonna add in those quick pickled onions that are gonna add not just color and texture, but also a really gorgeous, bright tang. A little squeeze of lime for acidity. And of course, our creamy sriracha sauce. I love this kind of food. A lot of different textures and colors. What a great way to use tilapia. It is just an inexpensive fish, very easy to find. So it's wonderful stuff. So I'm gonna pair this with a vignole from Les Bourgeois. And Les Bourgeois is right in the middle of Missouri near Columbia. And this wine has a really fruity flavor and aroma, and it does have terrific acidity as well as a good amount of residual sugar. So having that sweet and tangy profile is gonna pair perfectly with these awesome fish tacos. I'm so excited to dig into this. So thank you for joining me on our aquatic adventure throughout the Midwest, and I will see you next time.